Okay, welcome everybody. RDA Tech Q and A. You've got questions. We've got guesses. It's uh, we're back. I've done a whole lot of technical fixes. Had a bunch of technical issues as well. We'll talk about that in a minute. But um, because we, we wouldn't be a tech show if we didn't occasionally have tech issues of our own. Nash had, had this. I was oh, since the last show was trying to set up my computer to use SSDs, only to discover my motherboard does not recognize SSDs. It is in that window of SSDs have come out. We're making motherboards. You know this Venn diagram of SSDs, motherboard support, and crossover, you go, oh, that's great. Mine's like this. Oh, I've got... Oh, oh, I, yeah. I'm Nash. I do Radio Dead Air. I've been doing it for God knows how long. Longer than some of you have been alive. I, I uh, I've also have a long and storied history with tech and tech repair professionally. With me is my producer, Mike Gehrman. He has similar long-term experience. So we're going to start off this week. This fucking... And he's taking a shit right now. Okay? <laughs> I'm about to start talking about him. And he's taking a shit. Okay, well, he's so... Defi he's definitely a cat. I've been trying to make some upgrades. As you can see, things look a little different this week. I've been trying to make some upgrades and improvements to Radio Dead Air. And one of those was I was going to attempt to use my DSLR camera as our show's webcam or live cam. Yeah, which that would give you a great picture. Yeah, and have, you know, depth of field and all that nice stuff. It did require, however, some firmware adjustments because the model I had was not intended for that purpose, but some very kind people on the internet have hacked it and, and messed with it and turned on some options that weren't by default turned on. So I was upgrading the uh, the firmware to enable these things. Now, with, with most devices, at least modern devices, firmware upgrades have become less of a possible danger. I know many of you have, uh, have uh, with smart TVs, you've updated the software on your television without any issues, but you will note quite often they say, do not turn the power off during this process. Oh, absolutely. Because what you can have happen there is if... what was he? Because I just saw a cat jump by. He does that. He does that. Yeah. Okay, so what you can have happen when that happens is you can have a, a, a partial install, which is sort of like changing half the transmission on your car. Right, right. And you try to start the car up again, the car's like, no. Yeah. Now, in, in the computer case, the computer might well start until you get to the part where it goes off. This is the thing you only did halfway. And the real pain in the ass is it's just as hard to redo as it is to uninstall and start over. And sometimes... Unless your computer does things like makes a restore point before doing that. Computers are one thing. This this was not a computer. This was a DSLR camera. Firmware is in everything, guys. Every electronic device has some little internal... What firmware is, is the hard written operating system on that device that tells it how to do things, that tells it what it can and can't do, all of that and stuff. A, and at a very basic level, it tells it that it's a device. Yes. If the firmware goes away, you have a paperweight. So as I was in the middle of updating the firmware on my DSLR camera, which had informed me, do not turn off the camera during this process, to make, sh to make sure I did not lose power during this process, I actually went an extra step. I didn't use the camera's battery. I used the camera's AC adapter. So I had, I had this thing plugged into the wall to make damn sure I would not lose power. I, I see where this is going. With and the then along comes the him. <laughs> he doesn't even look guilty. Who decides just as it's about to complete updating the firmware on my $600 DSLR camera. He decides, hey, those cord things, I'm a fuck with them. 
bat, 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 bat. And knocked out the power for the DSLR camera. Right in the middle. Were you able to eventually get it going again? No. Damn. He bricked a six hundred dollar camera. He, Grady, you're on dry food forever. I I did intensive googling on this. I looked up everywhere, and the the verdict is: if you brick a Nikon D fifty one hundred, there is no restoring it. There is no bringing back the firmware. There is no flashing it back. There is no fixing a damn thing. A foo do, do you know how do you know how you fix it? I'm not even kidding. Do you know how you fix it? You send it to Nikon and pray? Yeah, they have to replace the motherboard in the camera. I did send it to them. And it's gonna be hopefully if they can do it, it's going to be around two hundred dollars to fix it. Maybe. Fingers crossed. If they can get the parts for it, it's a bit of an older camera. And by older, I mean three years old, which is an yeah. antique in electronic terms. Quite true. Uh, I, I have a question. This is just curiosity in my Sure, mind. sure. If the battery pack had been in there, can not switched over to that? Can't. The, the the D5100 is not designed to use AC power. So what they did was Nikon makes an adapter. This is an official adapter from the manufacturer that gives it power. I can show it to you. Do you want to see what the AC adapter looks like? It looks like a battery pack to plug in. <whistles> yep, plugs right into the battery slot. Gotcha. So it was a case of battery... Or, or AC, AC power. Yeah, you can't plug in both. Ouch. <sighs> Fucking fuck, you little... Don't look at me like that. You know what you did. $600, Grady. $600. Fucking cat. So that's going to be one of those. So a lesson for everyone out there. When you, if you are tinkering around with your electronic devices, be prepared to fuck them up sometimes. It does happen. Shit just goes wrong. We have uh, some stories and some questions to cover this week. Um couple of these one of these stories is very near and dear to my own heart yep especially when it comes to uh when we're talking about te um cameras and such there has been a trend lately that uh, i'll say that the subject of our next story was pretty much the the pioneer of this trend and that trend was being uh, dick to your customers Subscription software. So I was right. Subscription software kind of sprung up in the, I, I guess, the the wake of um, MMOs, really. Yeah. People yeah. people who were making software for like like Word and and uh, and AutoCAD and other stuff looked over at MMO games online. Big subscription games getting paid every month for the same thing over and over. And they thought, hey, we can do that. Why? Yeah. Why, why don't we get a slice of that nice subscription action? And so what happened is companies starting with Adobe, but, you know, Microsoft does a little bit of it as well. Uh, I'm sure there's others. I, I don't think AutoCAD is do or Autodesk is doing it yet, but it wouldn't surprise me if they're it's right around the corner. And this is saying, we're no longer going to sell you the product that you can pay for once and exactly. use until forever. 
we're going to rent you the product for 10 to $50 a month or more, depending yeah. on what features you want. And renting has its oh, own per, per, per user. Yeah. And renting, renting has some issues, shall we say. Now it has an advantage for the company and other, other than them getting money. And that advantage is it is significantly harder for people to pirate rented product. Yeah. And let's, let's be clear. Adobe products were pretty commonly pirated. They were some of the most pirated in the world. Yeah. So I can understand them trying to take measures to mitigate the costs of piracy, especially considering how much they already tried to. The earlier mitigation for the cost of piracy when it came to uh, to that sort of thing was to raise the price of Adobe software to reduce ridiculous heights but which if you think about it for a second someone's going well, i'm not I, I can't afford to pay 200 dollars for adobe software so i'm going to pirate it and then and the adobe response is well we'll raise the price to 500 dollars." i still can't afford it yeah yeah uh, please note i haven't pirated adobe software that was an example other than other than um Acrobat, they don't really make anything I need. They make stuff he needs. Make stuff I use all the time. So yeah, the as we said, the uh, the, the concept of, of, of monthly subscription is something that go. Oh, we can stop piracy, uh, and it'll be a lot more effective for us, uh, and it will only just annoy every customer we've ever had. And then there's the other problem with subscription costs, especially when it's something like Adobe, which is an industry critical set of, of software tools that's used in movie production, every fucking magazine and website, um, audio production. It, you can't do shit online without Photoshop if you're going to des deny design anything. Yeah. I mean, there are other tools out there, but you'll be in a very niche field. Right. So this week, and using the Brex and using Brexit as an excuse, which I'm sorry, I do not fucking buy this. Um, Adobe decided to hold its software hostage in the UK. Um, the Creative Cloud, yeah, Creative Cloud subscription software. The prices are all going up in the UK and they're saying it's well, it's because of the Brexit and your currency being weaker. We're going to have to adjust our charges. Now, Brexit resulted in the uh, English pound dropping about 20% yeah. in value. I'm looking at it now and yeah, 20% is about what it is. Adobe is asking for an, a price increase on their creative cloud subscription somewhere in the vicinity of 40 to 50 percent yeah which is a little bit more i mean if they were going this has gone down 20 percent we're raising our price uh just a similar amount to compensate everyone would go like oh we don't like that but we understand we understand the change in price because of the devaluation of yeah the and what's going to happen here because this is the way corporations always work let's say next week the pound regains 20%. Adobe's not likely to reverse on this. They'll keep their price where it was. And if then six months from now, say the, say the pound goes back up 20% and it stays there for six, eight months. And then it goes down again, 20%. You know what Adobe will do then? They'll raise their rate again. They aren't going to bring it back down to the previous rate. They're just going to stack it on top. Now, why this is such a huge problem like i said everything you see every graphic every visual on the web just about everything is made with photoshop it is an industry critical tool this is essentially extortion yeah it is cheaper right now to trans to to transfer pounds to dollars by adobe and say oh yeah we're using the license in the uk yeah 
it's now, really I don't jealous. know if you can do that. I don't know if you if you go, I, I bought this with dollars. What do you mean I can only use it in a country that uses do well, you use dollars here in the UK? We just have to take it to the bank and convert them. It It's... Now, when I mentioned this on Twitter, a lot of people said, hey, you just pirate it. They can't. You technically have the ability to pirate it. Sure. But if you're doing this professionally for a living, no, you, you don't. can't. Because once they catch you, you're hammered. Yeah. Uh, no production agent, no production studio, no video editing house. None of them can pirate this legally. Obviously, it's piracy. None of them can crack the software and use it because if they do, they're done. Yeah, that's why. That's why Adobe is a member of the Business Software Alliance. I, I, I'd like to point out, I effective. I don't live in a cul-de-sac. I live in a little bit of a loop. <laughs> There's no reason for that. Um. Now, now there are a few alternatives that are not great. There's one called GIMP, not as full featured. There's I've never I've never liked GIMP's interface. There's a there's a thing for GIMP called GIMP Shop where you can say make GIMP's interface look like Photoshop, and I'm like it doesn't really. There's a new up and comer called Affinity, which is is uh, I've heard things about, but again they still aren't in the same ballpark as and part, of the, and Photoshop. part of the reason for that is because Photoshop's been around for years and mm -hmm. years and years and has put tons of features in there. And so they've got all this stuff they've done forever. They're not like these other companies having to reinvent the wheel from scratch, not having to go, we need to make a blur filter. Okay, well, here's how the textbook says we do that. Okay, here's the code that and nah, it doesn't look spectacular. Let's adjust it, you know, etc. Adobe's been doing that for decades. And in addition to that, Adobe is the industry standard for plugins, which are the lifeblood of these third party plugins can make or break a project in a lot of cases. I speak from experience. Yeah. Because third party plugins are, are, will do things like, you know, that the original software maybe hasn't considered or maybe goes, you know, there's it's a it's not enough of a, a market for us to to do something with, mm -hmm. but the niche is wide enough that niche, whatever niche is wide enough that other people go like, yeah, we can make a few dollars here. We're not yeah. a dope people. We can make a few dollars. And being the industry standard, that means people code their plugins to work with Photoshop. And not it, what it they might be. Yeah. It, it, unfortunately, the, the plugins Photoshop uses the, the plugin format, I would say, is probably not a standard in the same way that music production plugins are yeah, with say VSTs or VST2s no, really where you can go I've got a VST I can take it to any software package that uses VSTs yeah. the, this it, it's it's very frustrating and this is why when windows started talking about window when microsoft started mentioning windows as a service Everyone in IT on the entire planet, their sphincters clenched. Yeah. So hard. So hard. You remember that scene in Superman 3 where he grabs a, a lump of coal and squeezes it into a dime? That was the sphincters of every IT professional. Because the idea that Microsoft Windows might shift from a licensing format to a subscription format, this is why. It would, <clears throat> they would, <clears throat> the government would go for that one, I think. Uh, something like that. Oh, I'm sure, I'm sure Microsoft would cut them a separate deal and just leave consumers and businesses to, you know, flop in the wind. Yeah. But regardless, yeah. This, this is why you, I can, I can understand a game that is constantly updated and is optional being a subscription service, but a tool, a necessary application for multiple industries, video production. The BBC is entirely swapped over to Adobe Premiere not long ago. So, yeah. and it, 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 it's it's a case of it's not like they were losing money. They just weren't making as much as they yeah. used to. 
it's it's a total dick move and adobe can just say sucks to be you what what the f did you see that yeah what are you doing you loony little thing what are you doing what are you, what are you doing grady He's like, you're not paying enough attention to me. That's why I unplugged your camera. Ridiculous goofball. What are you doing? Uh, yeah, we can't really make a plug in standard Photoshop uh, to respond to something in the chat because we don't own Photoshop. No. They get to set what their plug in standard is. Yes. Now, what would benefit if, if all the other Photoshop competitors got together and banded together and said, this is a standard for plugins? There, it might be enough weight to cause the plugin makers to go, yeah, we'll make it for that standard too. At which point, eventually, Photoshop would either support that standard or adopt it wholesale themselves. But in general, what competition? Adobe yeah. pretty much owns the market right now. Yeah. Th there would have to be some, uh, between the other competitors, there would have to be something probably on the order of 15 to 20% market share before that happened. Speaking of owning the market, um, everyone and myself included has been very focused on net neutrality as the next big issue coming out of the FCC. But they forgot that before Tom Wheeler, the uh, former uh, head of the FCC, left, he was championing, championing, I said the word, another cause, which was set top boxes. That's yes. for cable uh, customers. Um, if you are a cable subscriber, you know what it's like. You get a cable box from the cable company. You can't go to Best Buy and buy your own. Can't go on Amazon and find a cable box. You get one from your cable provider. And, and you have to use it. And, and they charge you for it. Yes. Not only do you have to use it, you have to rent it from them with a monthly charge. And um, Unless you are somehow grandfathered in that you paid for one initially and that's it. Yeah. And, and which gets your grandfathered until it dies. But um, it and normally that rental will end up being many times more than the cost of the hardware itself. Yeah. Now, and you think, well, I've looked at my bill. Rental's only $2. Yeah. A month for five years suddenly is more than the cost of the box. And how many years, how, how often have you ever replaced since the digital trans uh, switchover? Was that 2010? I think it was that long. I think it was 2011 or 2012. Yeah. Um. In that time, how many times have you changed out your cable box for a newer one? Probably not, not very. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless you just happen to have crap power in your apartment and that burns out electronics. Yeah. You know, it because that's it's something that's probably subject to it because they're on 24 seven, whether you're watching TV or not. Um. Yeah, no, they they make far more off of them than they they cost. And uh, Wheeler wanted you, the consumer, to have the right to go out and just buy one. Yeah. And the cable companies didn't like to say, oh, we provide all these other services that we won't be able to provide if they have their own box. And Wheeler's like, oh, then standardize the services so these other boxes can read them. And it it was going... And they lost their damn minds. Yes. Because they make a lot of money on those rentals, which is basically charging you... It, it's effectively for, free money for them. Free money, it's yeah. Two two dollars a month. You say again. You say that doesn't sound like much. When you have a million subscribers, that's two million dollars a month. Yep. Which they're not actually. If you've ever had to deal with your cable company, they're not putting back into providing service. God knows it's you just try to call them. Yeah. Hmm? It's just prop. Now the reason I'm bringing it up is um, the new FCZ chairman, Ajit Pai. Uh, just a partisan hack. Yeah, just killed this initiative. Coincidentally, Comcast is finally moving forward with this in their own terms. There's a Roku app now. Hold on, train, train, train. Oh, nice train. Um, there is a Roku app now that will function as a cable box. Isn't that nice? Yeah, it is. Except you will end up paying, let's see, um, $10 a month to use your Roku as a cable box. 
as opposed to the two fifty dollars, two dollars fifty cents you'd pay a month to just rent a cable box. So yeah, well, though, they, though they do give you a two dollar fifty cent credit towards that if you're not using the cable box. Oh yeah, so it's only it's only going to be seven forty five. That's nice. So th they're what they've done here is now. It looks like they are going to be using apps on other people's platforms, but they won't have to be providing their own hardware anymore. So, so somehow they're going to charge you more for doing less. They're going to charge end users more via these apps than you would if you were getting a cable box from them. And let me tell you, I'm willing to bet they're going to try and discontinue those cable boxes just for the simple fact of they won't have to provide a physical piece of hardware anymore. They can just push this all over on Apple Box, on Apple TV, and Chromecast, and Roku, and they won't have to touch a piece of hardware, which is less physical inventory, less money they have to pay out, and more money from you for nothing, for absolutely nothing. Welcome to the new FCC, yeah. everybody. Yeah, and what you saying? Well, wait, how does this work? Okay, so you have the option to watch TV without paying ten dollars a month for a set top box or whatever right. the charges for set top box. Use the tech you already have for a ten dollar a month outlet fee. Yep, and that's what it is. It's it's there's no reason for it. Uh, it's yeah. just for example, to give you an idea. There's, I'm reading some of the comments here on the RS Technica article Nash and I are using here. There's a person who went to Com, you know, with Comcast, bought a router modem off Amazon, called them up, said, "Hey, I bought my own modem. Here's the MAC address." Was up and running immediately. The next month's bill came, and had a ten dollar self install fee. They charged this guy ten dollars for calling in and saying, "Hey, I'm not using your shit modem anymore." They, they they charged him they charged him to do their own work for them appreciate that for a moment and that's legal now it is very possible that if he complained he could have get, gotten it taken off we don't know he didn't go into that detail yeah because i'll be honest here and i don't really feel like giving comcast the benefit of doubt it is far easier for us to blame comcast and say yes they charged me ten dollars extra and everyone's going to believe that and then say, but you're not going to follow up with, I, I browbeat them until they refunded it. You don't want to leave that because no one wants to give Comcast credit for shit because it's Comcast. Yeah, th this this is this is why we needed a strong FCC. This is and this is we have Ajit Pai. Ajit Pai, yeah, who is going to pretty much do whatever the telcos want. He's already starting to back off on some. Uh, there, there was an a net neutrality investigation for AT and T uh, and for. I believe Verizon as well. Yeah, that's being backed off of. Um, that well, it's been backed off of. Yeah, that investigation's uh, what, dead. What that one was was called a, a zero rate billing. Yeah, because Verizon and AT and T have their own sort of uh, video on demand service for their phones, and they're saying, well, our video on demand service doesn't cost you any of your your monthly bandwidth. But Netflix. But if you watch YouTube or Netflix, that does. That does. Uh, through through the 4G at least. If you're at home on your on your on your wireless, it doesn't either. But if you're home on your wireless, why aren't you watching on your TV? Yeah, it's it's but essentially it's it's the entire prediction we were making about net neutrality that they I mean, would true. they yeah. And so we're gonna have a I mean, fun four years. Yeah, the investigation. He said, oh yeah, yeah, there were some pre preliminary results saying yeah they can't do this. Well, we've decided yeah they can investigation closed isn't wonderful folks we are going to have a sh you're going to be get used to paying more for less everybody paying more for less oh so that is uh that's the news for this time out now we have questions we take questions from you if you have uh questions technical related stuff for mike and myself you can send those to Requests at radiodeadair.com. We will attempt to help you out. And you know what? We do this absolutely free of charge because some we things. Drink heavily. Well, yeah, there's that too. There's that too. Yeah, that would help. Um, okay. Let's start with. Oh, 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 poor Andrew. 
Let's start with Andrew's yeah. question. Okay. Um, Andrew writes in, we moved twice in the span of a few months and did our level best to move the computer safely. The moves might not have even caused the new problem, but anyway, lately the computer has taken to locking up. First sign is the internet will stall out. We checked it. It's definitely something computer side and not internet side. Network diagnostic won't come up to the next stage, and the whole computer will lock up, necessitating a hard reboot. Any leads on what this is? We're using Windows 7 desktop, run CC Cleaner, Avast, Malwarebytes, and everything else we can find to all come up clean. Oh, and the computer runs fine between these events. No signs of any problems until it happens again. So far, it has happened three times in two weeks and never happened before this last move. Okay, well, because you 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 basically eliminated malware, which yeah. is a good first step. Yeah, that's a good um, one. My first thought is that this is a hardware issue and that something has come slightly loose during the moves. What I would recommend... Uh, especially since you said it seems internet related. If your computer has a separate internet NIC, which some still do, unplug the computer, disconnect the NIC, reseed it. If it doesn't, see if you can find a separate NIC somewhere yeah. and try that out. What we're talking about NIC is the network interface card or the place where the ethernet cable plugs into your computer. Now, um, if you're using wireless, Instead, you don't have Ethernet cables running mm -hmm. around. You're using wireless. Um, try the uh, try the wireless adapter on multiple USB ports. I'm assuming it's on a USB port. They often are. Uh, um, failing that, uninstall the USB excuse me, the wireless adapter completely, including going into the device manager and mm -hmm. saying get rid of these drivers, and then reinstall it from from scratch, because it could be. I've seen this sort of thing happen with software before in a move where you think nothing went wrong, but something jostled something just right enough that the hard drive goes, well, this bit is wrong. So we, 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 I, and it goes, I need to reinstall this and it's better. I'm, I've am i seen this kind of thing before and it's normally damage that causes yeah. it. I, I'll be honest, damage is where I'm going to, which is why I said check your NICs first. Um, Likely, you can fix this. Uh, what you'll need to do is, if you're using um, an Ethernet cable, uh, if you if you aren't on wireless already, um, what Switch I'd recommend to wireless and see if that fixes. Yeah, it. I would borrow a wireless adapter if you don't have one, or get a wireless adapter, or just put it put a wireless adapter on it and see if it behaves. If it does, you've narrowed down the problem. It's your network connection. Um, at that point, you could either decide to stick with the wireless one, or you'll probably end up having to get, like Mike was saying, a, a, a network interface card to plug into your computer to take the place of the damaged one on, um, yeah, on and the they motherboard. Make, they make PCI, uh, Ethernet cards, you know, it's a PCI, what, one Ethernet card, PCI two, something yeah. like that. Well, whatever slot it fits, it's that really small one because yeah. you don't need anything bigger for Ethernet. Um, one other thing to check uh, is your power cabling inside on the motherboard. Just mm -hmm. make sure everything is still solidly and firmly connected because you go, yeah, we, we think it's the Internet, but maybe it's something else just not getting the right power anymore mm -hmm. because something is wiggled loose. The very first computer I built, I did not realize there was a second power adapter that needed to go to the motherboard. And so I'm like, why isn't the thing booting up? Oh, and, oh, there's a second, okay, plug that in. Still not booting up. Plug this, plug the first one back, you know, look, mm -hmm. oh, that didn't latch properly. Push it down hard enough that I thought I was going to break the motherboard. And it finally goes, click. Yeah, I, I wish we had better news for you, Andrew, but it, yeah. it does sound like that either in the, yeah. It, it, Loose connection or damages. In the case of plugging and unplugging the Ethernet cable or just moving it around, something has come loose. That's that's my best guess yeah. based on this information. One other thing you can check, and it's, it's, it's probably the easiest. Uh, if you're using Ethernet cables, have you been using the same cable from move to move? Your cable might be damaged. That might be a cheap way to fix it. Yeah, it, it may just be that cable's damaged. It's causing... 
it, it might have have a short in it somewhere causing information to go to the wrong place and confusing yeah, your just, computer. And it'll, and it'll be intermittent enough that you'll go, you know, like you, you stretched out by the computer, your foot brushes the cable and the brush is just enough to cause yeah. it to short. So that, that may be it. So I, I but yeah, from our, from our, the best we can figure from what you're saying, that's, that's hardware damage. Oh, we have more damage. Oi. This one from John. But, but, we've also got, but we've also got questions to deal with. Yeah. Hi, Nash and Mike. I've been trying to back up some photos to a USB stick for my Windows 7 laptop, and every time I do, the resulting files come out as a bunch of glitched up ghost files like this. And he actually named this this JPEG, what the hell? Let me show everybody here. Let's see on the... And it is a good what the hell. Let's have a look. Um, I don't know how well you can read these. Let me blow it up. This is gibberish. All of these these file names are complete gibberish. Um, each ghost file registers as being over three gigabytes each, even though the photos are barely over 200 kilobits individually. This is happening across multiple USBs, while the photos themselves uh, both display fine from their original folder, be able to move different hard drives without an issue. I was wondering if you can help narrow down what's causing this glitch in the transfer process. Okay, so first thing, that comes to mind for me is a damaged USB port or cable. The second thing that comes to mind is, okay, if this was, if this was a work environment, my mm -hmm. first thought would be you have somehow turned on external device encryption <laughs> and don't know that you set a password, but that shouldn't be the case. It shouldn't be, the, it shouldn't yeah. cause the file sizes to inflate that much. Um, uh, my second thought, if you go into device manager, mm -hmm. when you've got the USB device plugged in and bring up the device, there should be a setting in there. Uh, it's along the lines of use this fast or use this. Uh, it's not safe, but it's use it. Oh, let me find it again. I thought I had it open in Google, but I must have accidentally closed it. Well, he's looking that up. Another thing I'd recommend just, just to verify is use this USB stick with a different computer. Wipe all the files off of it. Try to copy some files to that USB stick from a different computer. See if there's something wrong with the USB. Uh, if it works with another computer, it doesn't work with yours. We've narrowed down the problem is with your computer. Um, what Mike said about the USB ports is another thing. Pins can get bent. They not not quite right and something weird happens um okay yes okay so here we go um uh, uh they gave me a picture here uh go to uh i thought there was a picture this is tom's hardware okay right click computer choose manager uh well first i would check to see if there's drivers for this any mm -hmm. driver issues there could be a usb driver issue but um you can bring up the device manager and look at the device and it's uh i still can't find the picture i was looking at earlier but the, there's a device setting on there that basically the, there's one that basically says you have to tell the system to eject the device before you eject it now windows 7 was supposed to be the first windows operating system where you didn't have to tell it that it would actually finish writing the stuff mm. but with some older usb devices it doesn't work necessarily well um, I'm still trying to find something so I can send an image to Nash, uh, so we can put it up maybe on the screen. Uh, yeah, in, in general here, if it's working in another format, if you're able to get it to, um, different hard drives without a problem, if you're able to get it to. Uh, if you're able to put it on the cloud without a problem, then we're we're pinning this down. There's something going on in your USB system. Yeah, and I'm sending Nash a link now. I don't know if you'll be able to put this up on the screen or not. Let's see. But this is this is off the how-to site, howtogeek.com. Um, yeah. And there's basically when you bring up the properties on a, an attached USB USB media device, it will under policies will pop up is a quick removal which is default which says it will write everything as it goes and it will finish doing the right 
uh, and you can eject as soon as any, everything is done. And then there's better performance, which caches things, and, but you have to tell it to safely remove hardware before you yeah. remove things. Uh, and I'm seeing that on some older systems, you can get really strange corruption errors uh, with quick removal. Yeah. That's our best guess, because that's some weird shit, dude. Yeah, that I mean, that's, that's some of, weird shit. That sort of font stuff is what I expect to see off the magic Russian hard drive. Have you ever heard the story of the magic Russian hard drive? Nation? I have not. The magic Russian hard, magic Russian hard drive guy who lived on the Russia side of the Russia Chinese border, where the border is a little coarse. Mm -hmm. uh, there where he was, was a hard drive manufacturing company, the kind of place where they make hard drives for possible big names, but they always make a few hundred more than the contract allows. And those sort of walk out the back door and get sold at nearby markets for really cheap. And so he bought one of these because he was about to get on the railroad and travel across Russia. And he wanted to load up his hard drive with movies. So he had something to do on a four day train trip. And he loaded all his movies on his hard drive and he got on the train and he started playing a movie and it played the first 30 seconds of the movie and then played the first 30 seconds again and again and again. And he couldn't figure out why, because it said all the stuff was on the computer. You're on the hard drive. And so he got to his location, having been bored out of his mind for four days because none of his movies were there, opened up the hard drive and inside the hard drive enclosure was a USB stick and, and two hex nuts to give it the weight of a hard drive. And you can search magic Russian hard drive and Google and see this thing. And somehow someone had made this USB stick so that it would report back that it was this huge hard drive and report back Hacked the firmware. Yeah. A file system that said, Hey, I'm a huge hard drive. You've copied all this stuff, but didn't copy a damn thing. Ah, uh, that's the kind of thing I expect to see from something really screwy. Um, one other thing, uh, if you're, if, if you're talking extra, you're talking, you, you were talking memory sticks here, not memory drives. So stick generally plugs straight in. If it was a drive, I would say maybe your cable is somehow really screwed up um, because a lot of people use the same cable for multiple devices. Um, but yeah, that's this is the one I said I've not seen anything like this before. Mm. Not with this. I've seen stuff get corrupted. I've seen stuff get lost. I've seen stuff not be recoverable because the drive has been damaged. I've not seen random gibberish as file and folder names like that. Even when it's encrypted, Generally, the file name is still there. You just can't open shit. Now it's time for a genuine hair puller. Yeah. God, I hate tech. I hate tech issues like this. Katie sends this one. Hi, Nash and Mike. I have a problem hoping you can help me figure out. Every day at approximately 1.40 p.m., my internet will cut out for a few seconds and then come back up. This happens to all my devices connect the internet, both wired and wireless. It's been going on for months, although the time seems to have changed a bit. I used to drop closer to 1 p to 1 p.m. According to my fiance, it also dropped early this morning at around 1.40 a.m. So it seems to be something that happens every 12 hours. Normally okay. considered. I can I can speak to sort of what this is. What your wireless device, either the transmitter, well, it's, it's probably your wireless base station, whatever, your router, mm -hmm. has some sort of firmware issue where mm -hmm. it has a counter, something it's doing. Yeah where approximately every 12, just over 12 hours, which is why it has slowly propagated from 1 to 140, that counter resets and resets something on your router because one programmer said, I will have this counter reset every 12 hours and that'll be fine. Another programmer said, I will use this counter for something important, not checking with the first programmer that it's going to reset. Oh, it gets so, worse. First thing I would check is if there's a firmware update. It gets worse. It's one of these. One of what? It's an RSDG1670A. It's one of these voice over IP router slash modem slash phone jack. Okay, so. Remember what I said about the programmers not talking to their 
It's probably just one programmer and he didn't know what he was doing. Uh, and she, I know where she got, she got that directly from her, um, from her service, from whichever service provider she has. That's where she got that from. It's, it's one of these, these giant ass, uh, I hate these things because they're so hard to replace. It, it, they're, 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 there's something about these with the voice over IP, with the telephone connection included. I had one of these for a while with uh, when I was doing some, some phone tech support with um, when I was on Comcast. I had some of these. They don't like letting you replace these. They're very picky about you. This isn't one of those you can just walk into Best Buy, walk out with the Motorola surfboard, Bob's your uncle. They hate the letting you use one of these yourself. I, I could I could not talk talk them into. I've read uh, looking these things up online. Ugh. All right. Well, you're through Spectrum Internet, Katie. Which used to be Time Warner, right? I think. Um, Katie. Mike is probably right about this being a firmware issue. If you can log into it, and I don't know if you can. She probably can't. That's the way they see set if there's a firmware up. update. Now, if you can't, what I would try to do first, if they won't replace it for you, because it's it may just be defective device. If it's been old, if it's old enough, it's suffering from some sort of you know bit rot that's causing it to cycle mm. every twelve ish hours. Um, if you can elevate a tech support call to get them to update the firmware, that's what I was about to talk about. Katie, what you're going to have to do is you are going to have to call tech support because you this happens a lot with modems like this. End users are not allowed to log in or make changes to the router modem thing because these damn all-in-one combos, it all has to be done via the support personnel over tech support. They have to do it remotely. You are going to have to call tech support. You are going to have to go through that ridiculous inane script where they ask you to turn it on and off, to plug it in again, even though that has nothing to do with your problem. You're going to have to go through all of that shit and they will not let you skip it because they have a checklist on the screen and if they don't check all the check boxes, they can't escalate it. So you're going to have to go through all the troubleshooting shit. And I know this is even more frustrating since it's a voice over IP modem and you might be using it for your telephone. Once you do case, all... Use your, your, your cell phone for this. Put it in speaker mode and once make, you do make a martini. All, once you've done all of that, once you get escalated, you are going to have to hope you get a technician who knows what the fuck he's doing. Because surprisingly... Just because they hire him and call him a technician doesn't necessarily mean the motherfucker knows what he's doing. You are going to have to explain to them, look, I suspect my firmware might be corrupted because every 12 hours it's doing something. It's knocking out my internet connection. Could you check and update the firmware, please? And Katie, I hate telling you this, you might have to go through this repeatedly because you will you may end up with a technician who tries to get you to do something else entirely just to get you the fuck off the phone and close the call. You may have to call back in again. And I am I hate this. This is one of the, this is why I despise yeah. modems and hardware provided by now, an ISP. One other thing I'm going to say to you in this in, with with regards to what Nash has just said. Make sure you write down the ticket number, confirm it, and when they don't finish and you have to, it doesn't, you're still having this issue, and you have to call back, make sure you refer to the previous ticket number and say his advice was of no help. Mm. Because sooner or later, you're going to get a guy in the office who knows the guy you had. It's going to take a while. If you have to talk to enough people, yeah. they'll go and they'll be telling themselves, oh, Bob did this. Screw Bob. I'll fix this shit. <laughs> it, th this is this is why I strenuously recommend if you are renting your modem or any hardware whatsoever from your cable provider, 
from your ISP provider in order to get online by your own. Yes, the upfront cost is higher, but in the long run, you can normally fix it by doing very simple shit that you have to call and waste three hours on a fucking phone call that maybe gets it fixed, but likely won't. Because customer service in ISPs is, look at, I, I think Comcast still has one of the lowest ratings in its industry. In yeah. fact, most of them, most of the ISPs are right at the top, the cable ISPs, right at the top for lowest customer satisfaction when it comes to customer service. Yeah, I don't know if Surfboard makes a, a, a modem with voice over IP capability built in. I mean, it should be, it should be, it's just internet connectivity, really. Yeah. But the reason they sell, they say voice over IP is because they put, or they claim to have put some special circuit in there or some okay, special but, firmware settings that prioritize voice over IP connectivity. E even, even if you look right here on, on the, on, on Amazon, it says buyer may need to have internet provider configure unit to their system. That's even that, that's one of these voice over IP modems. There really is no way around it. It's it's such a pain in the ass. What I would uh, honestly, what I would do hate them in this in this in this situation is if you can afford it, buy a surfboard modem and buy an Asus router that has voice over IP capability. I, I'm 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 telling you, man. They're they're not going to let her. They they don't like doing that. Part of the reason they do is they can force you to rent the damn thing. Well, we're on, we were on Time Warner here and we have our own now too. I don't know what hoops my roommate had to jump through to get it on there. Do you have but, a landline? Uh, no, we don't have a landline anymore. So you, do you have a voice over IP modem? Uh, I don't or have a voice over IP modem. That's the but, thing. That's the part of it. That's the problem. I'm trying to, that's the part. That's the issue. It's the voice yeah. over IP component. That that's what they they lock it down and they make it so you have to get it. And motherfuckers. Oh, I'm, right. logging, I'm logging into my router right now to see if it has voice over IP settings. And I think, other than some prioritization on the uh, on the wireless, it doesn't. Hmm. Next question is from Jake. He writes, uh, "Hey Nash and Mike." Is there any uh, any way you recommend to play games on the Mac? I like to play bigger games from Steam, but it doesn't really seem to work. I download games, they won't load, I guess because Mac can't handle it. Is there any way I can get around the problem? Um, unfortunately, what you're describing is a, a, a classic case of my computer is not cool enough to play the games I want to play. I need to upgrade my computer. Which is a real problem with Macs because they're so stupidly expensive. Yes! This is going to be, we may be able to help you a little, Jake, but you don't expect miracles here. Macintoshes are often considered wonders of simplicity and very easy to use by a lot of people. Um, the it just works thing. But part of that is because Macintosh desktops are more or less glorified laptops without keyboards. That's what uh, a Macintosh, the internal workings of a Macintosh more resemble the internal workings of a laptop computer than they do a desktop system, which is why Steam is, has so many problems with it. It's essentially you're trying to run games on a laptop with a yeah. Macintosh. And and you can do that, of course, with loud. I have a gaming laptop behind me mm -hmm. here somewhere. Uh, the problem is Macintosh has such a slow update cycle that the hardware you really you're stuck with whatever hardware they decided to give you when they finalized it and between yeah. finalization and and production there may be uh, you know significant upgrades out there yeah and you can't really upgrade it yourself either i mean hard drive replacement's about the only thing you can do on a mac what you can do is this all depends on what kind of hardware you have in your Macintosh already. If you have um, an AMD uh, Radeon or a GeForce video, uh, video uh, dedicated video card in there, you're in better shape than not. That, that's, that's already going to help you out a little bit there because that will provide a little bit more um, graphics. Mm. Oomph, oomph. Yeah, because otherwise you're stuck with uh, the integrated Intel graphics which aren't really going to do much anything. Um, you're, you cannot play many games 
on Mac OS. They're just not written for Mac OS. So what you're likely going to end up having to do is uh, boot camp and run it off Windows on the Macintosh in order to play these games. Yeah. But again, dedicated video card is going to help out a lot there. Yeah. Even Now, if you manage to get the games working on Windows, don't expect miracles. Maybe you'll get them at 720p. Maybe you'll have to turn down a lot of the settings to get them to function to get it to maybe 30 frames per second. They're not going to look great. Yeah, you're not going to, you're not, except for the pre rendered cutscenes, yeah. you're not going to see spectacular graphics. But you should be able to actually play some of them. Um, you don't expect to do it natively on the Mac OS, however, because it ju they just don't write games for Mac OS. Yeah. Uh, some do, like uh, Stardew Valley, which I believe has a Mac port, and it's very popular because it's one of the few games that can run on the Mac, and it's also a really good game. Um, there are a couple games like, I think, Binding of Isaac. Binding of Isaac, guys, Binding of Isaac Afterbirth, is that on, uh, is that on Mac OS? I haven't checked in forever. Maybe someone else will know. Um, that's not a tremendously super powerful game, but... Nash said something a moment ago. That's a really popular game. A lot of people love it, and I had to look up what Stardew Valley was. Stardew Valley's amazing! It is awesome! I love Stardew Valley. It's a great game. You're, you're, you're sim farming. My father turned the third of an acre in our backyard into a garden. There's a reason I don't do sim farming. No, but it's not just farming, though. It's you go and you kill things. There's, there's, there's also simulated murder. Do you get to simulatedly butcher pigs and turn them into bacon? No. See? No bacon. Lost sale. <laughs> uh, Binding of Isaac. Now, is that Binding of Isaac uh, original or Afterbirth? Because Afterbirth is a good one. Um. Wait, 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 wait. I, I recognize that I'm out of loop on certain games here. Someone named their game Afterbirth. The Binding of Isaac, yes. First there was The Binding of Isaac, then there was the first DLC, which was The Binding of Isaac, or is it, I think it was a remake, update. Binding of Isaac, Binding of Isaac Rebirth, and the DLC was Binding of Isaac Afterbirth. And Did now there's... Did anyone tell them what that word means? Yeah, have you, you should see The Binding of Isaac. They don't give a fuck. And then there was there's currently Binding of Isaac Afterbirth Plus. Oh, so it is it is actually sort of a creepy little game. It is not it is not just creepy. A, a, a funny funny creepy little. It game. is a disgusting game. You there's the creators of Super Meat Boy. There's there's a lot of poop, and there is a lot of pissing, and there's blood and guts everywhere, and. There are special items that enable you to poop on command. And there's oh, a lot a, of... Oh, it's a roguelike. And there's... Give that a look then. There's a lot of farting. And and there's a lot of sacrilege. A whole lot of sacrilege. You can poop on an angel in Binding of Isaac. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a roguelike. I might have to give it a look. Yeah. Um... So those are some of the games that would work on a Mac. Back to the point. We're getting back to the point here. Um, but uh, Afterbirth is on Mac OS X. Good, good. So there are some games you can play natively on Mac OS, but some games you're just you're going to be flat out of luck. Your best hope is to try Bandcamp. If you're stuck with Intel graphics, I'm sad to say lots of games are going to be disabled by default because they just can't do it they don't have the the shaders they don't have the the memory the power's capacity. not there yeah so it's it's like trying to 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 uh, tow a semi trailer with a bw bug yeah it's not going to work so unfortunately yeah that i that, was told we needed up our car analogies <laughs> That, that's one of the uh, the downsides of the Macintosh and why people say Macs aren't for gaming. They, the hardware cycles are just way too slow and the systems themselves are underpowered. They're not underpowered for Mac OS X, which is a variant of Unix. Is it a variant of Unix? It's a variant of Unix, isn't it? 
I believe Linux these days, yes. Linux, I, I didn't think it was Linux because Linux is open source. I thought it was a variant of the Unix, but anyway, it's still, oh, probably is. it's got the same underpinnings. It's a Mac. It can run on much, that, the, OS 10 can run on much lower power hardware than Windows can at, at a more satisfactory ability. But Macintoshes, like I said, they're, they're laptops without keyboards. That's what you bought when you bought a Macintosh. You bought a you bought a laptop without a keyboard is what you got. And it, it, it is a variation of Unix. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, Unfo I wish I had better news. I say that a lot, but that's the truth. Um. Anyway, that's that's going to wrap it up for us this week. Um. Yeah. If you have questions for next time, send those to requests at radiodeadair.com. We will attempt to get those on for you. Uh, in the meanwhile, Mike, myself, we'll see you back here Monday night for Radio Dead Air Live. Take care, everybody.